Dear colleagues, good morning. First of all, let me thank our colleagues from St. Petersburg for the possibility to present at this fantastic breakout session and summarize my experience in uh, the field. However, um, uh, now that I stand uh, in front of, uh, of you and have to deliver my paper after the previous presentations, I feel daunted. Um, our experience um, in um, gynecological oncology is a fairly recent one. This slide presents a historical photo. It's one of the first uh, laparoscopic um, operations performed in, uh, uh, in the Hertzen Institute in 2001. Since that time, we have co uh, covered a lot of ground and undergone quite a lot of difficulties because we needed to prove to ourselves and to our colleagues that laparoscopy is a um, um, viable method which is not inferior to laparotomy. Uh, the question, um, the question: How are we going to um, operate? Are we going to do it well, or are we going to do it laparoscopically? Uh, this is a question that got frequently asked in uh, at many conferences. So nowadays, uh, this question is reversed, and I'm happy that we are seeing discussions of uh, a randomized trial on uh, radical hystero uh, hysterectomy performed laparoscopically um, when uh, 15 years ago, just 15 years ago, we uh, um, felt scared even to talk about it. Um, radical hysterectomy, uh, that, uh, radical um, Hysterectomy can be performed efficiently, uh, laparoscopically is beyond doubt. So in the recent years, we have made a lot of progress in terms of uh, becoming more proficient, more skilled, and in terms of technology as well. So these are two. Um, uh, videos. The first um, comes from um, a conference where uh, we showed our skills in uh, uh, performing lymphadenectomy. And um, this is a, a more recent video from um, 2018. Look at how more advanced it, it is. So we now can. So when uh, when I often say that uh, the um, this approach is highly efficient and that a number of uh, uh, trials have uh, pointed to the efficiency of this technology. However, and now comes lag trial. The whole. Oncogynecological community uh, has split into two camps. Uh, many of us feel kind of offended because we did believe in laparoscopy. We spend a lot of time learning it, mastering the technique, and it's uh, not really refreshing to see um, our records being discarded, dismissed just like that. On the other hand, more traditional surgeons uh, keep saying, uh, remember what we said about la uh, laparoscopy, you should have listened to us. We're told it was unsafe in the first place. And we have uh, a community of younger colleagues who don't know which of the techniques to master. Um, there are yet other colleagues who say, um, we lived without laparoscopy and we're going to do without it for the years, uh, for the years to come. There are many advocates of lag trial. There are many opponents to um, 
these findings who um, try to defend the approach they have been preaching and practicing for a long time. So I was hoping I could present good results from my experience, which could confirm that uh, what I'm doing is good and beneficial for the patients. And when I tried to analyze what I have achieved as a surgeon, when I took the courage to do that, because generally this is not done at conferences. I was slightly discouraged by the facts that I found. In the past few years, I worked for different institutions, including uh, the Herson Institute, Hospital 62, and uh, Blockin Oncology Institute. I have performed surgeries on 62 patients with uh, 1A2, 1B1, um, cervical cancer. Similarly to the Petrov Institute, I build on uh, uh, careful selection criteria. And I am um, quite uh, grateful to Elena for pointing out that um, specifically that we shouldn't probably begin working with large sized tumors. And in our group, 98% of our patients have tumors of less than two centimeters in size. The follow up period. Um, is um, fairly significant, from uh, ranging from two to seventy-one months. Uh, the, however, the uh, median follow-up period was sixteen months. We regularly started performing these uh, surgeries in twenty fifteen. Most of the patients were operated on within the past two years, so sixteen months. It's not enough to claim to any objectivity and to uh, assure that our results are good. So this slide will be just for your information only. There have been three uh, cases of progression. Uh, uh, patients uh, develop metastasis in uh, the uh, lymphatic nodes, and uh, unfortunately, we lost them. However, uh, this is something that is difficult to associate with uh, laparoscopy and ambiguously. Um, so uh, we need probably need another two years to be um, able to get more reliable results. So we have. We are now um, following up uh, 35 patients with uh, um, uh, in the post-surgical period from three to 55, uh, five months. Um, progression was only found in uh, one patient um, that was operated on by the uh, tracheolatomy um, um, methodology. It's the method that we developed and modified in our center. This uh, is performed before colpotomy, before uh, resection. I would like to thank Professor Kuhle, uh, who um, gave us, uh, who initiated us in uh, this method. So this population of the uh, patients needs to be considered in the within the Russian context, within a different context. I wanted to slightly deviate from figures, numbers, uh, this whole discussion of randomized control uh, trials 
and look at the situation with radical hysterectomy in terms of our mundane everyday work in Russian reality. And within the context, uh, and maybe broader within the context of the new independent states. Uh, so, what are the benefits of laparoscopic hysterectomy to patients? There are a number, a number of uh, benefits. We felt there were a number of benefits, which is why we pioneered and uh, implemented this method. However, let us remain objective. What we know is uh, laparoscopic uh, hysterectomy ha uh, is associated with uh, low blood losses. Uh, hey, what about laparotomy? Uh, the average uh, blood loss in case of precision performance is uh, uh, within 500 milliliters, at least in my experience. So laparoscopic, uh, uh, laparoscopic uh, um, surgeries, laparotomic surgeries may result in larger blood losses, but this is very uncommon. On the whole, uh, uh, on the whole, sequelae are uh, present in the forms of uh, uh, lymphorrhea, in the forms of in the form of cysts. As far as the quality of life is concerned, something that we have been talking about. We didn't conduct any studies comparing quality of life in uh, laparotomy or uh, open or laparoscopy surgeries. Uh, However, the quality of life uh, differs only in the post-op period. Um, what about the uh, adhesion processes? So, um, in the intestinal area, uh, this is a highly uh, debatable factor because not all uh, patients uh, do develop adhesions. And finally, cosmesis. Many of my colleagues will be surprised by what I'm about to say, but we need always to look at the question from different sides. What are the benefits for the surgeons? I'm not talking about uh, lymphadenectomy plus hysterectomy. I'm talking about uh, radical hysterectomy proper. A long learning curve. Um, this um, technique requires a lot of skill and a lot of preliminary training. Professor Kuz uh, Kuznetsov um, said that uh, he mastered the Wurheim method. This is one of the most complex methods there is, and uh, one that displays uh, some variation from patient to patient. So uh, the uh, training is fairly time consuming, can be very time consuming. As far as labor costs are concerned, uh, the uh, Laparotomy, uh, laparoscopy um, takes three to four hours, uh, over which the surgeon keeps standing, okay, in a very uncomfortable position. Um, one of the with one of the feet constantly on the pedal. So um, there are some complexities here. It's a huge strain on the surgeon's body. And it is also important uh, how well equipped your OR is. You need to have a good uh, operating table. You need to have excellent equipment. You need to have excellent ventilation so that you don't breathe in, this, uh, breathe in CO2 all the time. Uh, you need to have a sufficient supply of uh, high-quality instruments. If this is available, fine, have fun. But uh, if this is not, uh, it makes the intervention very difficult. Uh, another important factor is the team. 
the surgery teams that you work with. Um, because um, all of the members have to be really competent. They need to. They don't. Uh, uh, they need to be sure. They need to be absolutely confident, uh, um, and they need to know which buttons they're pressing. And another benefit for the uh, surgeon uh, would be ego. The ego value, mastery, applause, the credits that you're going to get from the others. Uh, many surgeons uh, labor under the impression that um, laparoscopy is um, highly complex and it's um, a signal that you have achieved a high professional level. So um, very often uh, the ego um, factor is at play here rather than the concerns for the benefit of the patients. What are the institutional benefits for these uh, from these technologies? So number one is the number of surgeries. If we're talking about um, low size tumors, how many surgeries per year do we perform? If the department can perform twelve hundred surgeries, 20 or 30 of them will be radical hysterectomies, probably less than that. So what, what is the tragedy? What is the problem? Uh, the um, OK, so there are certain financial benefits. Uh, the, um, uh, the surgery definitely reduces the uh, patient bedtime. However, the difference is not that huge. We work in a federal, state controlled, uh, or municipally controlled institutions, so we're not terribly driven by uh, financial concerns. The limiting factor to me is not so much the bed turnover, it's not so much the patient bedtime, uh, but the, the limiting factor is the uh, capacities, uh, is the capacity of this uh, of the operation room. So nobody makes us to uh, discharge our patients, to release our patients earlier than necessary. Cost efficiency is another factor, especially at the time of the economic crisis. At the time of economic crisis, when they prefer foreign-made equipment, how efficient they are. No one has calculated the cost uh, entailed. And so uh, with all these factors, uh, as a surgeon um, who um, uh, did a lot to work like that and now um, under criticism, I keep wondering, why do I do that? How many patients do I get who ask me um, about radical hysterectomy? Well. Uh, very few. Moreover, these patients come and say, you can have a laparoscopy. And they say, my oncogynecologist said not to agree because my tumor will go all over the abdomen. And the others do not even know that this approach is possible. And indeed, when a patient comes to you, in most cases, it doesn't matter for you what kind of surgery she's going to have. She wants to be treated. And so what are we talking about? Why are we discussing all of that? For me, after all these um, you know, experiences and practices and after thinking like that is not that addictive. So what is the electoral? Is that the change of the standard? Yes, of course, the standards change and the previous speakers have said that the ban on the use of laparoscopic surgery for surgical cancer, I don't think it's hardly po it's possible. It's hardly possible at all. Every single surgeon should understand what he deals with and uh, uh, analyze the risks. 
Oh, uh, the, the kind of a situation that might be provoked. So when he makes a decision on laparoscopic uh, uh, radical uh, laparoscopy, then of course the surgeon should think about that seriously. So should we go back to the beginning of the century, uh, to the time when uh, laparoscopy was almost banned? So my colleague, uh, uh, Dr. Tulanina, is here. I deeply respect her. She is a very extensively educated uh, doctor and has a lot of experience in gynecology. Uh, she wrote uh, a short article uh, about uh, laparoscopic surgery. And there is quite a lot of um, um, uh, uh, things in this letter that are not that clear. He said that uh, the year 2018 was the year of uh, great uh, disappointment in um, uh, minimal um, invasive uh, surgery in oncology. So we should not extrapolate the results of one trial over the whole laparoscopic sphere. I don't think it's correct. And uh, the disappointment, there is no disappointment indeed. Those who didn't like the method uh, are just happy. It's a great joy for them. But those who have been working with this particular method will keep looking for the better outcomes, for the ways to solve the problems, and all the others will make decisions depending on what comes next. So, in this sense, the interpretation of the results of this trial should be objective. And uh, well, initiation of the new randomized uh, um, uh, trials, I agree with Pedro, who says there would not be any new um, initiated by his center, well, at least by his center. Well, they might be started, and we could probably uh, initiate a trial like that in the Russian Federation. but. Um, there is immediately a number of problems that arise. First of all, standardization of the techniques uh, um, um, uh, and methods of um, radical hysterectomy. If we take the surgeons who work um, in the open uh, approach, with the open approach, who follows the classification, who uh, follows tip B, uh, C1, C2, and so on and so forth. Usually, a surgeon selects a certain approach to um, uh, radical hysterectomy and replicates this particular technique to all the patients. And this happens quite often in different oncological institutions. So standardization of techniques is needed that the training of a surgeon, no matter what the authors of the uh, study and the trial say, I believe that it's um, um, a critically important issue. It's very difficult to follow uh, the procedure. And the surgeons are so different. The Igor Dutya said it's difficult uh, to randomize the surgeons, but it does not mean that talking about this, we should not uh, um, uh, accept the possibility of uh, laparoscopic surgery. Well, patomorphology, that is um, um, a stumbling block for us. If we want to have any sort of a trial, any sort of a study, we have to work a lot together with the patho pathomorphologists to get objective results, um, rather than what uh, Professor Ramirez described when he said somebody uh, uh, sees something and uh, the others just follow what's written on this paper. Uh, so as for me, um, uh, here is my personal opinion. I'm not going to um, uh, um, uh, operate like that with the visually detectable tumors of cervical cancer. I do believe that the best candidates for this particular treatment are uh, patients with uh, um, one, uh, one B with conization carried out and indications for radical hysterectomy. And it's important for the patient to be not against uh, laparoscopic intervention. We should never uh, force our patients into this or that particular solution. And uh, um, uh, uh, how do we assess the effectiveness after uh, the um, um, intervention. And of course, we don't want to hear from the patient that this particular treatment was suggested, um, r potentially uh, dangerous method was suggested by the surgeon. As for the manipulators, uh, uterine, uh, uterine manipulators, well, of course, we can speak about the different uh, you know, endings uh, that are specifically designed in order to make it less. Uh, um, 
Uh, no, uh, intrusive. So uh, we say that this device, we, I used to say this device is bad, this device leads to the spread of the tumor and it increases the number of um, uh, recurrences. recurrences. But with all of that, we uh, have the loops for colonization we use with that, we carry out the um, uh, scraping, we carry out colonization, and uh, some of our staff members carry out this work and we get six or seven fragments of the uh, cervix uh, up to one centimeter with the uh, growth of the tumor through the whole um, depth. And so these are tumor destructive uh, operations that open the um, vessels and uh, um, lead to the direct uh, contact between the vessel and the tumor. But w for some reason, we talk about the uh, uterine manipulator. No, there are no effective uh, proof at all that it's so bad. But the instrument is very good because it ensures the safety and shortens time. And of course, uh, the electrical is very important. And it's very important, of course, to see these results published uh, timely because it's important for the surgeon who already have the experience of laparoscopic radical hysterectomy. It makes it possible for them to go back to look into the uh, past and um, um, analyze their own experience. It does not mean at all, well, as I said, um, it does not mean at all that we should stop with that. We should stop with the laparoscopic radical hy hysterectomy. Everyone makes a decision for oneself, and the decision might be taken at the level of the Ministry for Public Health. Standards might be changed. But at this particular stage, when we are now at the transition period, the surgeons make their own decisions, and uh, um, uh, it's up to them to decide whether they should go into that or not. And the results of this particular trial will probably um, uh, slow down our uh, gynecologists who want to go into oncogynecology. Here are some of the answers to the questions I get very often asked when the surgeons uh, ask me uh, to be present at the Verheim operation. And I ask them in return, why do you do that? Why do you want to do that if you do not have uh, sufficient knowledge in oncology or gynecology? It's very high operation that you want to carry out, but what is the purpose? Well, again. Proficiency and applause. Now, uh, I must apologize for being so emotional, but um, I've been working on this presentation all through the night, and that's a chance for me to speak up. Thank you very much.